Let's hear it, all right? All beautiful. You bet. All At this time, I have uh, the distinct privilege of uh, introducing to you a special friend, someone who has been politically involved for not that long a time, but has had a tremendous impact on state government and the state legislative process and standing for truth, standing for the Constitution, and standing for the principles of the people that the people indeed govern themselves through their elected representatives. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you Senator Kent Sorensen, who has a special endorsement that he would like to share with you tonight. Kent. Thank you for the warm introduction, Drew. Um, tonight's a little tough for me. I've been serving as Michelle Bachman's state chair over the last year. And while Michelle has fought tremendously for my conservative values, I believe we're at a turning point in this campaign. I believe that we have an opportunity to elect a conservative, somebody that holds our values dear. And when the Republican establishment is going to be coming against him over the next few days, I thought it was my duty to come to his aid. Just like, just like he came to my aid during my Senate race, which is a very nasty race. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's the right thing to do because he fights for the values that I hold dear as well. And I just want to tell you guys that I'm, I'm going to do everything I can in the next few days to help in Iowa and beyond. And we're going to take Ron Paul all the way to the White House 2012. to forget. We had 75 killed, we had 115 wounded. Vietnam was hell. We had never been thanked for our service, never. Congressman Ron Paul got my medals for me and presented them to me. That was an awesome feeling. People break down and cry because they're getting the medals that they finally deserved. It takes a veteran to understand a veteran, and he is a veteran himself. 
Ron Paul is a veteran's best friend. He said, thank you for your service, and shook our hand and gave us a hug. That will always be there. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. Ladies and gentlemen, with, with your help and hard work, the next president of the United States, Ron Paul. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Sounds like we're getting close to an election. Hey! No, thank you very much for being here. I want to thank all the veterans that are on the stage and all the veterans out here and the rest who have come. I would like to in introduce two family members here. I think they're standing over here. I have two granddaughters with me, Lisa and Linda. They're sisters and they're students. <laughs> also want to uh, thank Ken Sorensen, Senator Sorensen, for stopping by. That was a very nice visit. But this is a wonderful evening because we're going to emphasize, you know, our national defense, our veterans, and our military, which is, of course, very important. As has been said, and as I've said for many years, the Constitution is a rather important document and that we should uphold it. <laughs> and, the do and the Constitution is very clear. The Constitution is very clear on what the responsibilities are at the federal level. The federal level, the, the defense is a vital function of the government. There are a lot of problems, and the problems are manifested by a lot of people being upset in this country, and I think a lot of people have that. We're all upset, and we want to change it in Washington. Matter of fact, that's what our purpose is. something, you have to know I'm what's wrong. Idea. As a physician, if I didn't get the diagnosis right, I couldn't possibly get the treatment right. So therefore, the diagnosis is very important because right now, most people in this country know there's something seriously wrong. There's something seriously wrong with our foreign policy. Of course, we all know there's something seriously wrong with our monetary system and seriously wrong with our Federal Reserve system. Well, I think the uh, best way to boil down the crisis that we face is a debt crisis. We're in too much debt. It's unsustainable. Our productivity is going down. Their special interests have benefited. The Wall Streeters get bailed out, and the debt is being dumped on the people, and that has to be reversed, let me tell you.
But we're in this we're in this trouble because we haven't followed the rule of law. The rule of law is the Constitution. Article one, section eight is very clear. It tells us exactly what we're allowed to do, and we're not allowed to do anything that is not explicitly given to us in the Constitution. Matter of fact, the Constitution is mainly a document of prohibitions, prohibitions against the federal government intruding in our lives and intruding our economic conditions. And also, there is no authority in the Constitution to become the policeman of the world. And though there's clear evidence that we should have a strong national defense, and that is a vital function of the federal government, we also know that if you do not take care of financial affairs at home, the, the problems that we can get from, from the problems overseas may magnify. The Soviet system collapsed for economic reasons, not for military reasons. So, we have to maintain a healthy economy every bit as much as we have to have a strong national defense. One of the we reasons we've gotten into trouble overseas has been we haven't followed the rules. It's been a long time since this country declared a war. The last time we did it, after we were attacked, and properly so, we, would, uh, we attacked uh, both Japan and Germany, and guess what? It was declared by the Congress and supported by the people. It was over in approximately four years. We had proper authority, and we were together. Since that time, we haven't done it. I maintain that a president should never take a country to war unless there is a declaration of war and fight them and win them and get them over with. For many years, young men and women have been called to service. Some of us have been drafted, others have joined with the purpose of providing defense for this country. But because so many of our young people have in the past and currently join to defend this country, they can become disillusioned if they find out that the fighting and the killing and the spending of the money doesn't provide national defense, that we're not under threat, that sometimes we go looking for trouble and putting our troops in harm's way unnecessarily. And because, this, because our country is literally bankrupt, we can't pay our bills, and we have to keep borrowing, we keep spending, we keep printing money, and we cannot maintain this presence around the world. So therefore, we can't even afford to take care of our people back home. So my suggestion is to look carefully at our foreign policy and question whether or not we should be in 130 countries and have 900 bases. I say that's way too many. It's time to come home from most of those places. But too often, too often when we've been called uh, to duty and, and so many of us have gone, coming back home has not always been the best of uh, receptions. Think today, as both a physician and a congressman, and having been in the military, I have to deal with a lot of veterans' problems. It's very, very frustrating because so often veterans are shunned. They don't get the treatment they really deserve, and the money is being wasted elsewhere. It took a long time for the victims of Agent Orange in the uh, Vietnam War to finally get all their treatments, Persian Gulf War Syndrome. And even today, 
we're currently suffering from abuse of our veterans when they come home. Hundreds of thousands are looking for help. I had a young man the other day who was just got out of the military, and of course he was sad and despondent about how many fellow soldiers that were killed when he was over in Iraq. But he says, you know what's happening now? He says, some of my buddies now are committing suicide. It's like an epidemic. So there's something terribly wrong with the system where, uh, where it ends up so tragically and, and the help isn't available. But I believe that it's related to our foreign policy. The foreign policy should dictate how we go about, how we go to war. We should obey the Constitution, go very sparingly, and we should go preserve the peace and prosperity and the safety of this country, but not to go looking for trouble in different places of the world. We've had a foreign policy that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So often we go around and we find a friendly dictator and say, well, our national security interests are best if we prop up this dictator. No matter what he does to his people, we've done it numerous times. So we give him a lot of money. And then it goes badly and he changes his mind and then we have a fight. Then there's other countries we go to and they don't want to cooperate with us. So uh, we just go ahead and we use weapons, of ma of weapons and destroy their country and bomb those countries. So we either use force or money, force or money. And I thought, well, there has to be another option. How about talking to them once in a while instead of using force and intimidation? During the, I was, I was called, to do, called to duty, called, called to the service in 1962 during the missile crisis of Cuba. That, that was resolved rather quickly, but then I was in the Air Force for five years later. I did not go to Vietnam, but it was during that period of time. But if you add up the decade the French were there and the decade the, uh, the Americans were in Vietnam, it's trying to settle a civil war in Vietnam, how many people were killed? Probably maybe a million Vietnamese, tens of thousands of, uh, of, uh, of French soldiers, and then 60,000 Americans. And then we had to leave after all this money and waste. And what did that usher in economically? They said, and Johnson at the time said, we can have guns and butter, it doesn't matter. Spend money on more welfare and more guns. And then they gave us the 60s, which were a very, very uh, bad time. But the argument, for us to go there. It wasn't the argument go to the Congress and find out whether we should declare war or not. The argument was that if we don't go there and stop communism from rolling over, there'll be a domino effect and that whole region will turn communist. Well, it turned out that we walked away from there after a lot of tragedy. China, they became less communistic when we left. They became capitalistic in many ways and now they're our banker. So what is, what's happened in Vietnam? Has it gotten worse? Did they go communist? No. All of a sudden they became westernized. They liked by looking at what we were doing. They started trading and, and interrelating with us. We travel there. We invest there. They come here. And just think of what has been achieved between our two countries in peace and what was not achieved in war and waste. We need to look at that. A strong America is necessary. A strong America is going to give us a much better, peace, a much better chance for peace. But also what we need is we also have to have prosperity as well, and therefore economic conditions are so important. Debt is the big problem right now that we're facing, and we have to admit it. So even if somebody would say, no, we can't cut a nickel out of the military budget, just remember the military budget is different than the defense budget. The military budget is all that what all the weapons the military industrial complex wants. But there is a big difference between that. But today, both leader and the leaders of both parties are not interested in cutting one nickel 
out of overseas expenditures. Most of them want to increase it, and they're furious if you don't meet the automatic increases. And my suggestion is different. My suggestion is that we have problems here at home. We're spending too much money overseas. We're getting in too much trouble. Our obligation is to take care of the people here at home a long time before we ought to be the policemen of the world. So this means that I've made a modest suggestion for the first year in office, that is cut spending by $1 trillion the first year. This would take some change in attitudes. Like I said, we have to have a change in our foreign policy. Not sacrifice one penny for defense, but stop spending so much money overseas. Now that should be a lot easier for we, the people, to come together, both liberals, moderates, conservatives, if they want to concentrate on taking care of America, why can't we come together and, and stop this spending overseas? I would think that would be the easiest place in the world to cut spending. So half of the spending that I'm proposing in that first year would come from overseas spending. But it, it would mean that we would, uh, you know, bring the troops home. We'd bring them home from Korea and Japan, Germany. There may well be an immediate uh, economic benefit by all those salaries and uh, wages of the military spending their money here at home instead of in Germany and Japan. But that still wouldn't be enough cutting. You'd have to cut some more. So um, I uh, have picked five departments, uh, five uh, uh, departments to cut. and. Uh, and then also go back on the budget levels to 2006. You know, government wasn't like it was uh, too small back in 2006. Just go back to 2006, and that gets you down. After three years, the budget would be balanced. The only reason that this doesn't happen is people in Washington are in denial. They don't think there's a deficit spending problem. Today, guess what? The president has announced that uh, he's going to ask the Congress to raise the national debt by $1.2 trillion. Oh, no, a absolutely not. But guess what kind of trickery they have, and guess who did it? It was the Congress last summer when they had this resolution, you know, when they created the super committee that was gonna solve all our problems, they made a deal with the president. This is the way it works. The president goes to the Congress and it says, I need to raise in the national debt $1.2 trillion. And uh, if Congress doesn't do anything within, oh, if the Congress doesn't reject the request, in 15 days it becomes law, automatic. They have to reject it. And guess what? He's going to ask for this increase when they're on Christmas vacation. So the debt, in a way, is going up automatically. They're on autopilot. And believe me, this economy is not going to sustain it much longer. This is a worldwide phenomenon. It's a dollar phenomenon. It's a monetary phenomenon. And it's intertwined. We are very much engaged right now in bailing out Europe. And we're doing this through the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve does it off the books. They don't even get audited. Until we can get rid of the Fed, we at least ought to know exactly what they're doing, and Congress ought to force them to tell us what they're doing. approaching a crisis time, economically speaking and politically speaking, our liberties are at threat too, not by an outside invader, 
Nobody's going to invade us. We have the strongest military. We've had done a great job militarily. But we've also taken that oath to beware of enemies, both foreign and domestic. And uh, we have a lot of our freedoms under threat right now. But we're, we're at a crossroads, and we have to make a decision. And it's a decision that the founders actually had to make because they got sick and tired of the king. They got sick and tired of the taxes and the oppression and soldiers being put in their houses, the loss of their privacy. And the American people are getting that way too. And we have to make a decision, once again, what should the role of government be? The founders wrote the Constitution, said the role of the federal government at least would be very, very minimal. And uh, right now, though, the federal government is very, very large, and which means that every power and authority the federal government gets undermines your personal liberty. The goal in all political action, from my viewpoint, should be the promotion and preservation of individual liberty. If our military has been so successful and we don't have to worry about anybody invading us, then what are our concerns about it? To me, it's, it's, it is the economy and the way we've lived beyond our means and the way we have become careless with our liberties, that we allow our government to do too much. We had a, a major crisis, of course, a, a major event which was so terrible for us to, to uh, withstand. And that, of course, happened on 9-11. 9-11, you know, was a very bad episode, and uh, a lot had to be done. But, but uh, we didn't do exactly the right things at the right time. For instance, one of the first things they did within days before they decided who did what and where we would go, they passed a piece of legislation that had been floating around for years and they shoved it on the floor and within an hour it was passed and nobody had time to read it and that was the Patriot Act and that took away your Fourth Amendment rights and we don't need the Patriot Act. And of course, uh, just recently, we have had some other changes. Matter of fact, early uh, this, this year, the president announced a policy change. He said now that it was proper, uh, with his, uh, it was proper for him to have the authority to assassinate an American citizen, even if they have not been charged with anything, if he thought it was necessary. Uh, very bad. Now, of course, the person they picked out, probably a very bad guy. He talked about stirring up violence. He was never charged with it. He never had a trial, and yet it was decided that he would be assassinated, so we used a, a uh, drone and we assassinated him in Yemen. So let it go by, he's a bad guy, he's gone. But the principle, the precedent is very, very dangerous. So the next week, they decided, well, his son looked like a pretty uh, shady character, too, so they sent another missile over to get the son. Well, they got him, plus his, plus his cousin. They were back in the backyard barbecuing, killed them both. The son was 16 years old. And this, this is not the way America's supposed to be. We're supposed to be a nation of law, a rule of law is what we want. So, in one sense, when we go into the military, we take the oath and we go and fight and, and endanger ourselves to protect our Constitution. At the same time, our Constitution is being eroded right here at home. Just this last week, two weeks ago, I guess, the National Defense Authorization Act, that act has in it. I'm always impressed that so many people know about it. That means we have a healthy society and the internet is working. But that bill 
essentially eliminates posse comitatus. It, it's institutionalizing military law that the military can arrest an American citizen without charges and being denied an attorney and, and held indefinitely even in a foreign prison. This, this is not good for us. And fortunately, we're able to get some information out, and a lot of what we've done in our campaign makes use of the internet. But also, there's an attack on the internet right now. You know, it's uh, stopping, the, uh, the, stopping the bill that said they're gonna stop uh, the all, all, uh, all, all theft, the theft on the internet which means they're opening up the doors to know everything you do and to measure everything you do to protect you from yourself. Let me tell you, governments can't protect you from yourself and they don't need to be taking over the internet either. Of course, they all these things are done, you know, to, to take away the Fourth Amendment. They call that the Patriot Act uh, for the Internet. They stop uh, uh, online um, piracy act, always these good things. You know, when that Patriot Act was being voted on, I remember it so clearly because I sat down next to another member, and, I, and he was voting for it, and guess what? I was voting against it. <laughs> and so I said to him, I said, why are you voting for this? I said, you probably don't even know what's in it. You haven't had a chance to run it. Oh, I know that. I said, you know, there's going to be some bad stuff in there, don't you? And I told him a few things. Yeah, I know that. I said, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, the conditions are we just had this attack. People want us to do something, and it's called the Patriot Act. How can I vote against the Patriot Act? He said, what would I do if I had to go home and explain it to him? I said, well, that's your job. Go home and explain it to him, you know, while you're doing it. We will have to make a decision real soon. Whether it's six months or two years, I don't know, but it's real soon. We're able, from Austrian perspective in economics, to predict certain events will come. We can't to tell when. The Austrian economics taught that there was, and we fully understood there was a housing bubble. And we knew there was a NASDAQ bubble. We didn't know the day that it would burst. So there are certain events that are coming that are going to happen, and they're going to be very dangerous. But they might come in a day, a week, or a year. But the foundation of the system has been eroded. So therefore, the collapsing and the falling down of the system. The financial system is on, on shaky legs. The militarism that we have overseas, it's very shaky because you know, there are plans right now to spread the war into Syria, and then how soon can we start bombing Iran? And that's very precarious. So we now have a system where our personal liberties aren't being protected, and there could be problems in the street. We have had some indication that people are speaking out, and they have every right to, and they should. Whether it's the Tea Party movement or the Occupy movement, they're just, they're just desperate because they're dissatisfied with the government, and they're looking for some answers. But what we have to work for is to work our way out of here and try to prevent the violence and respect and honor the rule of law and respect all individuals to protect everybody, not just certain people from all these crimes. You know, I talk a lot about the wars going on overseas. I did my best to try to stop them. I remember the first speech I gave on the House floor uh, about trying to stop something in Iraq. It didn't happen in 2001 or 2000. It happened in 1998. That's when they passed a bill that said it is now our policy to have regime change in Iraq. I said, it's going to lead to war. So we. We, we know what they're trying to do, and we have to try to stop. We have to work our way out of it economically. That's why I want to cut the spending work away. But I want to take care of the people who have become so dependent on government, even though it would have been a better way of taking care of them. You take the elderly on Social Security. It was a contract. But we can't honor that contract if we keep spending this money overseas. So I would take care of those people who are on Medicaid, Medicare, and the people at home in Social Security. But you can't do it the way we're doing it today. If we continue to do it today, 
you'll have the economic calamity, you'll have a runaway inflation, nobody's going to have anything, and you're going to have violence in the streets, and that will be very, very da dangerous. We're not immune from that. What I see is happening is we're seeing something very wonderful slip away from us, something that we have all benefited by, you and I and our families, and for years. Even today, we still have a lot of apparent wealth, but our wealth today is all based on debt. If every, all the bills had to be paid, there wouldn't be much wealth. What if we had to pay the 15 trillion national debt? What if we had to pay $3 trillion to the Chinese? You know, it, it, uh, that it, you can't have it based on debt. But what has happened is we had a great constitution, we had maximum freedom, we had a continent that was special, had a lot of natural resources protected by the oceans, and we got soft. We had so much wealth that we then, as a people, concentrated more on the wealth than we did on And we got careless, and the liberties have slipped away, but our wealth will slip away as, as well. If you don't have true liberty, the wealth cannot last. And in the last hundred years, it didn't happen. Yeah, I, like, I do my share of, of criticizing the president. I've already done that this evening once. But let me tell you, it's not this administration. It wasn't just the previous administration. It's been decades of bad economic ideas and bad foreign policy and bad monetary policy. That's where the problem is. But what this system did was it bred the uh, interest in government being taken over by the special interest. You did much better by having a high paid lobbyist and going out and producing a product. Besides, producing products became more difficult because over taxation and over regulation of monetary system, all the things that we have done to chase so many of our businesses away. So it became that such that lobby in Washington became the most important thing. So the lobbyists control things. Medical, medical reforms, when they have new legislation, Republican or Democrat, guess who gets involved? It's the lobbyists, it's the corporations, it's the medical companies, insurance companies. It's not, people aren't represented. They might tell you that, but you're really not represented because in a free society, you don't have the government involved. It works differently. Just think of this effort to give everybody a house. That ended up with everybody that they wanted to give a house, ended up losing a house, and the people in Wall Street get bailed out. What about this effort for the federal government taking over education? They've been doing that for a good many years. I think it was a bad idea. I don't even think we should have a Department of Education. But the results, the results have not been good because we became more dependent on the government. The government would take care of us and provide for us, whether it's medicine or education. So in, in the old days, in the old days like when I was in college and medical school, I was able to work my way through school and it wasn't so expensive. But today, how difficult it is. It's so expensive and it's hard to get a job, so it's hard to do it. So the enticement is become an indentured servant to the government, borrow the money, and owe the government money for years, and not be well enough trained to take some of the jobs that are available today. There's a lot of jobs available, but they're technical jobs, and we don't have the training. So we're graduating these thousands and thousands of students, and right now the students owe a trillion dollars. They owe more money than our credit cards. So it's a failed system. This is what I think people are realizing in what's happening in this campaign. People are giving up, and I think it's a healthy attitude. Don't depend on the government. The government's supposed to protect us and forgive us our freedom and let us take care of ourselves and not be dependent on the government. There's one, there's one other war that I want to mention that I think has been detrimental to our liberties, and it's a, home, it's a war much nearer home. You know, we have, a, we have some problems on our southern border. I know that's a long way off from Iowa, but we live down there in Texas, and we, we have a problem on the borders. In the last five years, it's estimated that 45,000 individuals, probably mostly Mexicans, have been killed 
you know, on the border. So there's a border war going on down there. But here we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars, losing our troops over trying to decide where the boundary line is between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think we should be more concerned about our own borders here at home. But the war, the war that we have on our southern border is, is complex. We have, the, we have the issue of illegal immigration, and I, my argument on illegal immigration, if you didn't subsidize it, you'd have a lot less of it, and, and no, no, no enticement. But the, but the border is interconnected with another war that has not played well for us, and that's the war on drugs. I think the war on drugs have been very detrimental to our personal liberties as an excuse to invade our privacy and do many of the things that are unnecessary and it doesn't solve the problem. Before 1914, there were no federal rules or regulations on, on, on drugs. The real war and modern war drug came up in the early 1970s. We've spent like truly over a couple trillion dollars on the war on drugs, and there's still a lot of people using those drugs. And a lot of times they're using a lot of prescription drugs too, more so than even the illegal ones. But prohibition of alcohol didn't work. Alcohol is a very dangerous drug, but there, there's something that uh, we, we should think about on this. If it, if it isn't working, uh, why, are, why are we doing this? And the one basic principle I think is wrong is alcohol is a very deadly drug. And um, if a person becomes an alcoholic and asks for help, we show a little empathy. They treat him as a patient. We have centers where they go to. But if somebody is caught using a drug that they have made illegal arbitrarily, you become a criminal. And I think, maybe it's because I'm a physician, I'd like to think about the drug problem more as a medical problem than throwing people in prison for using it. But freedom is, is a wonderful experiment. It hasn't been tried all that much. Most of history has always been run by tyrants, dictators and kings and pharaohs. And, and even today, I fear that our government is getting more tyrannical. There's more authority. We don't really have property rights. And they don't even need search warrants to come into our houses. So we're losing, we're losing a whole lot. But freedom to me is so wonderful because people use freedom in different ways. You don't have to decide what your religions are. There was a time where the government decided what the, you know, the major religion be. But we don't believe in a theocracy. We shouldn't be domineering. People understand this pretty well, that you can pick and choose your religion. You can pick and choose your intellectual materials. But so often what we have done is anything we want to put in our mouth, it seems like the government has to give us permission. So if, if, our, if we're expected to deal with our eternity and our intellectual life, why aren't we responsible for our own bodies and make our own decisions on this? The encouraging part is that a lot of people are listening and a lot of people are excited about some of the things we've been talking about tonight. Talking about where America went wrong, the greatness of our Constitution, the greatness of our, of our traditions, what sound money is all about, what a sensible foreign policy is about. And we don't have to give up anything. We don't have to give up our defense. And for you to be safe, you don't have to give up your liberties. This idea that you have to give up so much of your liberties to be safe, that's nonsense. You don't have to give up any liberties to be safe. Now the other, the other warning some others give, oh yes, it's bad, we have to do all this. Uh, but you're going to have to sacrifice. Now, 
if I can, if I can wave the wand and have my way and have enough people come into the Congress with me and we can change it, and I give you back your liberty, uh, your life is your own, your responsibility is your own, give you back your freedom to act as you choose, give you your freedom to keep what you earn, tell you where you can spend your money and use your property as you see fit, why is that a sacrifice? That's not a sacrifice. That is what you need. But there's a lot of excitement going on, and um, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged about next week. I hope everybody comes out and, and votes. But as important as the election is and what we've dealt with, and I've been doing it for a long time, but uh, the uh, interest is growing out of great need because we need, we need some answers. But uh, this, is, um, this is something that is an intellectual fight. It's an intellectual. We have to know what we want. We have to be convinced that freedom works. We have to be convinced that we cannot depend on others and we don't have any right to tell other people what to do. And if we did that, if we use that golden rule on interpersonal relationship, we ought to know how to use the golden rule on international relationship. If we don't want other countries doing anything to us, we shouldn't do it to them either. But because, because of the crisis that we're facing, there's a lot of independent thinking, People now consider themselves more independent than belonging to parties. But where I really get encouraged in two areas. One, with the students. The students, the young people, high school and college, and recently out, the young military people, they know what liberty is all about, and that's what they want. But then there's... Then there's also another group. Sometimes I forget about them, but I might place myself in that group. Some people of a little bit older age that have been around, and they remember a little bit about what it was like to have more personal freedom and personal responsibility. Some of them have been around, and they've sort of dropped out. They haven't been voting. They haven't been interested because they've been stung too many times. The candidates say one thing, and they do something else. And I call them the political remnant. There's always a remnant in society, no matter how bad the society is. Just think of what it was like uh, in, uh, in communism, they had the Solzhenitsyns. They were part of a remnant that held the truth together. So, so there is a large number of people, and I think they're coming out. They're coming out of the woodworks. They're saying, you know, maybe, maybe we see a chance of a real change. So, and it's, it's galvanizing, and I think it's getting very exciting. I don't think for a minute that it's going to be easy, but I know one thing. If we don't put our mind to it and work our way out of this, and we just go along with the status quo, uh, status quo and continue to do things we're doing right now, believe me, it's worth the fight because that would be very bad. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here to help, ask you for some help for. But we don't need the status quo. We need to restore the greatness of America, the greatness of American freedom, and the wonderful country that we live in. Thank you very much.